just start recording just so I don't forget. We have two minutes. Yes. Okay, deep breath. Should we do our morning meditation together? That seems appropriate. Well, let's all take a deep breath, breathe in some peace and breathe out some stress. It's called mantra meditation, right? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kayla Doolittle. I'm a graduate assistant here at the Graduate School, and I'll be moderating room one for the day for this day of the conference, switching out with some of my coworkers. Um, first up, we have doc, um, Dr. Linus that's going to present and share some of her research, and then we'll we'll have a period for questions afterwards. If you have questions throughout the course of the presentation, you can post them in the chat below and I'll give a little um, verbal warning when it gets a little bit closer to the end and we'll have time to answer those questions. And if there are no questions, I know I will have tons. So um, we can get started if it's okay with you. Yes, uh, Kayla, thank you so much and welcome everyone. I just want to double check. So. My entire presentation is 25 minutes. That means that I have 20 minutes to go over my material and then five minutes for questions. Is that correct? Correct. And if um, it may be a little awkward giving a presentation to an empty room, but for the sake of bandwidth, it is recommended that if the participants can turn off their video if possible, just so that we can save a little bit since we have so many people on this Zoom call. So thank you guys. Should I also um, turn off my video? What do you think? It, it's up to you. Um, okay. I, I mean, it's, it's completely at your discretion. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everyone. I, I have a privilege to share this research with you all today, and I thank you all for coming. So uh, this research um, study um, was set to explore cultural factors that may contribute to coming out experiences of Latinx individuals who reside in border city areas. Um, why did we decide that that was uh, an important study? Well, um, at first it was uh, driven by the counseling student that I was, that I was teaching because um, part of their projects was uh, to do literature uh, review of um, you know any topic that they were interested in. And so what we found um, while working on those projects together there was not enough literature that um, specifically focused on the coming out process of Hispanic individuals. And more so, um, there were not enough, uh, nearly enough uh, research um, talking about those individuals who reside in border cities. So what do we know about that culture? Uh, it is um, quite interesting. There's sort of um, this this cultural encapsulation that happens in the border cities because often, um, um, individuals get to almost stay closer to their cu culture of origin. They um, often go back and forth um, uh, literally across the border, but also um, we see a lot of code switching and um, there seems to be closer ties with their um, religion of origin and, you know, various cultural traditions in comparison with those individuals, they're further removed from their uh, country of origin or a country where they speak their native language. So that was an interesting phenomena to explore. So what, uh, what did we find? We found that um, recently published studies, and when I say recently, it's uh, within 10 years, um, they um, had uh, about only 50% of Hispanic individuals in sample sizes, which is um, kind of you know, can be representative, just depend on the sample size. And uh, what we did find is that research that did include individuals of a Latinx um, heritage background um, had um, quite a nice wide age range, which is that that was exciting. Um, so 
what we um, what we noticed, what we read from the previous literature that did focus on our area of interest, that uh, negative friend and family interactions um, to coming out process um, often lead to development of mental health symptoms such as anxiety, depression, stress. When rejections happen, which happens quite often uh, when people come out first, uh, that actually has been connected to some negative long-term effects, um, including problems with creating close relationships in adulthood. Um, during the coming out process, um, individuals typically seek acceptance in the following order. Uh, it is much safer to come out to close friends first, and then we um, notice that mothers were um, the sort of a second closest or safest person to talk to, um, and then siblings and fathers were mentioned to be the last ones. And then further, we'll kind of see um, how our research results may may support that. Um, those individuals who fail to disclose uh, or come out due to the fear of rejection and they stay closeted to their family, they're more likely to suffer from low self-esteem. We see that there's increased um, risk for suicidal ideation and engagement in risky behavior, such as um, having multiple sexual partners, um, you know, unprotected sex, um, et cetera. So sort of... Um, kind of um, acting out, a little bit acting out behaviors. Um, what we hoped to accomplish, the purpose of our study was to describe the factors that, um, to really, first it's, it was um, um, to identify those, to really understand the factors that influence the process um, of uh, coming out. Um, we only focused on gay and lesbian individuals during this um, study. And why did we think it was important to conduct this study? Uh, because um, a multicultural competency development is one of the um, core important um, um, requirements set um, for by our um, accreditation body. And that's um, as counselor educators, we are um, teaching our counselors to be multiculturally competent. And um, um, sexual identity falls under one of the um, one of the important factors that we um, consider under the um, cultural competency and um, especially working for those um, counselor educators uh, and counseling students that work and live in border region of United States and those provide services to to clients um, and the lack of the literature that has been um, um, provided by, by then or by now, till now, it's important to contribute to uh, the body of literature so we can train our counselors better. Sorry, it was long-winded. So um, how can these research, so we believe that our research results can assist uh, those counselors that both work in the community and the school settings uh, in uh, not only knowing how to help clients to work through their sexual identity issues, but also promote social justice um, and, and social justice advocacy for those that uh, may be struggling with coming out and potentially having a risk of um, having consequences for the rest of, um, you know, their adult lives. So um, after receiving an IRB approval uh, from a, a university, we have um, sent out a mass emails uh, on campus of a university located on a US-Mexico border and recruited participants. What we were interested in, uh, we wanted them to reside or having you know, lived most of their life in a border town region. We wanted them to have a Hispanic heritage and um, be an adult because of the informed consent um, issues with, with minors. Uh, we have um, asked them to meet with us um, personally and allow us to conduct a one hour interview that was audio recorded. So um, the process of um, coming up with the questions for our interview was quite interesting. Um, there is a, a researcher, um, Cass, uh, who was an um, Australian um, researcher 
and is an Australian researcher, she came up with um, a cast stage allocation measure that um, that is a an instrument she developed in order to help place an individual into a, um, a specific stage of their sexual identity development. And so we reviewed that model um, and we thought, okay, so if this uh, questionnaire can help place someone in um, a specific stage of their sexual identity development, we may draw some helpful information on asking them questions that, um, about their process of coming out. So we have, um, we have a sort of set on to a two-step process of creating our questionnaire. In the first step, the group of um, two researchers came up, came up with a tentative set of open-ended questions that were in line with each subscale of the stage allocation measure. Um, and then um, they, during the second step, another team of researchers uh, met and they um, cross cross referenced questions, took some questions out that they were repetitive and finalized the set of the 10 um, open ended questions that we were planning on using for our data collection. Um, uh, I think our recruitment process took about two weeks, uh, which was amazing. And we had 13 participants that were willing to um, meet with us. We had seven females and six males, all um, identified as Latinx, and they were born and raised on, or spent majority of their life in the border region of the U.S. We had a nice age range of uh, between 18 and 51. And um, one thing that uh, because we use the convenience sample, we um, had all of our participants either uh, pursuing higher education or um, just completed higher education because we did have some, um, you know, one participant kind of brought someone else in that they knew that were not currently a student. And all of them were bilingual, um, Spanish and English. So um, we have transcribed um, all the interviews and some of them were a little longer than an hour. And um, in order to decrease or sort of deal with the researcher bias, we have um, sort of, um, we split the interviews um, for further analysis um, between us in a way that we are not really familiar with the interviewee. So um, I received those transcriptions that I have not conducted myself. Uh, and um, I, I didn't mention, but um, there were four researchers a part of this um, study, and each one of us conducted some of the face-to-face uh, -face interviews, and of course, all of us participated in transcription. So we sort of swapped um, the um, transcripts that we, are, we, we were analyzing, and we used the consensual, consensual qualitative research analysis uh, in order to uh, find the um, in order to identify the domains um, and then finding um, the core meanings and coming up with categories um, that had something in common. So we have um, identified three, I believe it's three major domains. Um, the first one and, and sort of the largest one uh, was the Hispanic, we named it a Hispanic cultural influence. Um, what we um, what we read and what we heard our participants say that um, the parents, the Hispanic parents, a source of stress and fear while they're um, considering coming out process. And uh, parents are often either in denial that um, there is, you know, their child may be gay or lesbian, uh, or they show complete rejection um, and say things like, um, if you say that you're gay or lesbian, you're completely, um, you know, exiled from the family. Or things they may say when they're in denial, they um, share that they may say, oh, you haven't met the right woman yet or the right men yet, that's, that's okay. Um, another category in this domain was Catholic religion equates with rejection. Um, family members, peers did not accept homosexuality because um, it's, it's against the religion, because starting a family is really important and uh, because sanctity of marriage is very important. And so um, whenever participants mentioned about either thinking of coming out 
were already coming out, um, there was a lot of conversations about how it goes, it goes against religion or how religion needs to step in and you know the, the, the religious community needs to help them to not be that way, which is, which is expected. And we've seen that with other religions as well. Another category um, that we um, noticed was the border region influence. Um, and um, what they mentioned is in order to be open in public, we have to go out of town to more to larger cities, to less conservative areas. Um, moving away, away from border town community um, was um, a way to come out. Um, so um, several of them mentioned that once they're done with school, they're planning on moving away from the border because they feel like um, border is too conservative, um, both because of the um, religious um, conservatism and also uh, there's a lot more concentration of um, people of same cultural background. Uh, the fourth category that we found that was um, um, kind of a little bit smaller, but still have been mentioned by several participants, is that um, there was a lot of confusion about um, homosexuality and gender identity. Uh, and so the things that participants said um, when they came out um, to their family or friends, um, they um, sort of, um, said, oh, now, so now you can go hunting with me if, you know, if you're a female lesbian, uh, because hunting is something that men do. And so there is a lot of misunderstanding and misconception um, related to gender identity and sexual identity. So the second domain that we um, found that it was, we called it testing waters. And what it really means is that um, at, at some, at different points uh, of their coming out process, our participants either um, sort of tested waters as experimented with both genders, which is common um, among, um, you know, LGBT community. Um, they, sort of said that it was helpful to know whether I want to be with, um, you know, an opposite gender or not. Um, another one, uh, the second category was peer support and testing what is with peers. And as you remember, literature reviews mentioned that peers are the safest people to come out to. And so our participants also reported that they felt most safe to try coming out to peers and gauge what their reaction may be and um, see if there is a peer group that would be more supporting, supportive and um, sort of testing that and process with them. And another one was, uh, which was the smallest one, uh, some of the participants mentioned that they sort of tested coming out strategies uh, by um, kind of figuring out, okay, should I just come out and say that? And a one a specific one said that he, um, he sort of said, well, what if I am gay, then what happens? And so uh, he would like sort of play those um, things out with their friends and family or safest, uh, which was his mom, and um, kind of see their reaction. And um, so that, that was another area in this domain. So um, the last one that we've seen um, is the, we called it within and between group discrimination. So not only, um, sort of the factor that prevented people with uh, coming out was the fear of discrimination. Um, such things they mention as their, um, even though they may come out to their family, they're keeping up appearances of being hetero uh, at work with some family members uh, in order to protect themselves. Um, there, there were several participants that did not feel safe um, in, in that border city, they've talked about a fear in, you know, aggression and um, violence towards them. Um, they, um, yes, yeah, so that's that. And then also um, the other category that has been pretty prevalent is that the border city um, LG, LGBT community is pretty divided and um, uh, sort of um, very cliquish and um, there is a lot of mistrust within the community itself. And so uh, there was no unity and they did not feel like they do have support 
often when they need to. Um, and I, we, and we're not sure whether that has something to do with the border city or the uh, the cultural background or just in general, um, whether the LGBT communities in other areas are, um, you know, maybe divided and not as united. But that's another thing that we we have learned from this sample of participants. So why uh, why what we have learned what we have learned, why is it important? What can we do with this information? Well, for one, uh, we we realize that um, those uh, people that found themselves, you know, being in the uh, border city communities, um, they certainly can benefit with um, a lot more support. And unfortunately, um, at the time of our study, there were not a lot of support, local support groups, and so we realized that they probably need to have um, access to um, the hotlines, or and uh, we as um, Social advocacy agents uh, in, in the community need to create more ally organizations because allies are certainly very important. Also, based on the stories of participants feeling rejected and stigmatized by their religion, it is important that we create um, a list of places that are friendly for worship. Um, and um, it is important to help them seek spiritual connections uh, because all of our participants mentioned that they were raised Catholic and they have gone through, um, you know, a lot of um, sort of, um, um, well, anyways, um, I have to keep going. So there was a lot of issues between their um, own spirituality and the religions that has not accepted them. Uh, it is also important to understand the concepts of machismo, marianismo, and feminismo um, because they certainly affect the way that sexual identity development process uh, and, and, and have consequences on that coming out process. It's important for us to address the consequences of rejection that may happen uh, due to coming out process. Okay, and um, it's uh, it's important for us to provide empowerment um, with helping um, our clients to form positive identity development and teach them emotional focus coping strategies to respond to discrimination. Um, it's important to focus uh, while working with clients that are struggling with coming out process and being rejected by their communities. It's important to help them develop self acceptance. And um, we need to provide psychoeducation to the community in teaching them that there are long-term consequences of rejection. And so there obviously, as any research, we had uh, multiple limitations. Um, we, uh, we were all counselors and um, this topic was kind of close, you know, it's, it was important for us. So we may consider having an auditor that's not affiliated with the study or maybe not even, um, you know, affiliated with any, with work in the border region area to help us um, sort of decrease some of this researcher bias. Um, also, uh, we realized that all of our participants were Catholic, uh, they were from U.S. border cities, which limits general's ability to other cultural context. And uh, of course, our convenience sample was, um, our sample was convenience sample, and it consisted of mostly university students. And while we had 13 participants, um, it, the, we, we may not have reached the saturation needed. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if you have any questions. I know you said that there is, you um, did a, the convenience sample, so there was a couple of limitations there. Is there any other way that you think this data would have been collected that may have provided different outcomes or results? Mm, so let me help um, help me understand what you mean. So you wonder if I uh, if the way that we we um, recruited the participants or if we, our participants were different people and not students, whether we had different results. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really hard to say. It's certainly um, you know, and it's it's a very good question. Um, 
I'm not sure that I can give you a definite answer. One thing that I uh, want to highlight is that our participant age range was really wide. So our youngest participant was 18 years old, which is, you know, beginning their career in college. And our oldest participant was 51 years old and, um, you know, already had, um, you know, had a lot of life experiences and then returned to college at the later stage of their life. And so I thought that, um, you know, given the, the wide age range for, uh, for, for our participants, we may have captured, uh, you know, information that we may have gotten from those people that were not affiliated with university. Um, and Jackie has a question. Um, can you define familialismo? Familismo, yes. Uh, Jackie, maybe you can also help me define familismo, but familismo is uh, upholding family values as very, very important in anyone's life, right? Um, is that what you know about familismo, Jackie? Yeah, I was just making sure. Um, I have another question. So what Latin American countries were the majority of the participants from? Were they mostly Mexican, Caribbean, South American? Yes, um, so I believe out of 13, uh, we're 12, we're Mexican American, and one of them was, um, I think had a Guatemala background, Guatemalan heritage, but most of them were Mexican American, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So um, I'm glad Jackie bringing up familismo. So there's also machismo and marianismo. And we are probably all familiar with machismo, right? That's, um, you know, man is the head of household, need to, needs to be manly dominant, um, you know. And marianismo is sort of, um, it's not the opposite, but it's also that women um, in the women in family have a specific role, which is, um, you know, cook, uh, clean, keep keep up with the house, have children. And so uh, that idea of Marianismo, when it come, when it applies to women that were coming out as lesbian, um, it was kind of going against the cultural beliefs of, um, you know, women's choices. And somehow, because of there was some misunderstanding or misconception of gender roles and sexual identity, when women did come out, um, the parents sort of grieve the, the kind of understanding that they may not, you know, be married or have children, which is incorrect, right? Well, thank you so yes, much. Yes, I believe that. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, said... Jake asked another question, but I know we have to. Say <laughs> okay. Sorry. sorry. Uh, apologize. Um, and we are going to move on to the next presentation. The same rules apply throughout the thing. There'll be 20 minutes for presenting and five minutes for the chat with the questions. If you want to start sharing your screen, we have a um, presentation on uh, macroinvertebrate diversity and abundance as indicators of stream health in an urban watershed. And I will give the, the chat warning five minutes before the end of the presentation time and a verbal warning two minutes from the presentation time. And again, please keep your um, mics muted, your videos off to preserve bandwidth, and um, we will answer the questions in the chat. Any questions? Are you able to share your screen? Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Just give me a thumbs up or something in the chat. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, some, some research that I've been doing with some students. In, uh, in my aquatic biology class um, in the watersheds uh, uh, that drain Columbus. So, so this picture here is of um, Bull Creek right before it dumps into the Chattahoochee. And we'll see that from a, from a higher uh, perspective, from a Google Earth perspective in a minute. But I um, just want to take a, a, a short minute to explain kind of what this stream is here. So, right, so you can see there's a lot of sand, there's a sandy bank here. This is, this is within the, um, the coastal plain ecosystem. And it's a fair, Bull Creek is a fairly large stream here. There's, it's probably, you know, uh, 50, uh, 30 to 50 feet wide in some sections along here. So it's quite a big, 
quite a big stream right before it dumps into the Chattahoochee. Um, so uh, to kind of give us a perspective on, um, on urban watersheds uh, and, and the important role urban watersheds play in ecosystems, uh, there's this really captivating picture on the cover of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that shows a large river or stream here, highly channelized, right? And, and so you can see the concrete borders along that stream. And then there's built up, uh, you know, enormous city right here all around that stream. And, and so this just depicts kind of the, the big changes that, um, that happen uh, when a stream is, um, is urbanized or when a watershed is urbanized. So, you know, we tend to channelize those streams. You can see that clearly here. Uh, we also create dams and that's a really good source of hydropower that's uh, relatively um, benign, but has big implications on the community structure of the streams that are dammed. Uh, we also tend to pollute these ecosystems, these stream ecosystems by dumping our waste uh, dumping our um, sewage into them. Um, and, uh, and this um, results in, um, in low oxygen levels and a variety of other, um, other negative implications for the uh, aquatic community that, that is in these streams. Um, finally, there's a, a really important role for impervious surface. So this is, you can think of impervious surfaces like concrete. So concrete is, uh, is going to increase the amount of water that runs off these, uh, these areas and into these streams so that prevents the ground from absorbing that water and moving that water towards the stream slowly. Instead, it all jumps into the stream immediately and that causes uh, a real flashy response from the stream. So the stream rises really fast, all that water runs downstream and then it lowers really fast rather than a gradual increase and decrease if um, these systems had more pervious surface cover that allowed the water to drain in and drain uh, towards the stream through the ground, right? We also tend to homogenize these systems. Uh, they become um, stormwater runoff streams rather than a stream that has bends in it and has snags and has complexity that fosters a diverse community of aquatic invertebrates. This leads to declines in biodiversity or the number of species that are present in a location. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, there's another jargon word here, ecosystem function tends to decline. And ecosystem function can be defined in a variety of ways, but the way that I'm defining it here are things that the ecosystem does that provides us with services. For example, right, we dump, um, we dump nutrients and we dump waste into these streams. Instead of us having to clean them up, and we, and we do in wastewater treatment plants, but there are still lots of nutrients that flow back into the Chattahoochee uh, down at the, at the bottom of the city, south of the city. Um, though Chattahoochee then, um, through a series of, of bacteria and other um, macroinvertebrates, processes those nutrients and stores those nutrients and removes those nutrients from the water, essentially cleaning that water as it travels downstream. So that is one example of an ecosystem function that streams do. And those, that particular ecosystem function is impaired when these systems are homogeneous, when they are channelized, which um, allows water to flow much faster, preventing those systems from processing the nutrient. All right. And so again, I, want, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but this is a, a, a fairly complex diagram um, from a textbook showing the effects of sewage on a variety of abiotic and biotic processes. These pictures sort of illustrate the same point, right? So when we have fertilizer runoff, you see this green algae on this, uh, on this sidewalk here, and that's just an indicator that there's a lot of nutrients flowing off of this green grass up here and into this sidewalk so much so that it is causing green algae to grow on concrete. You can see um, this algal bloom here on the side of this lake because of runoff is feeding that algal bloom. And, and so that algal bloom in and of itself is producing oxygen and, and photosynthesizing, but those organisms are also dying and consuming oxygen and that can lead to 
anoxic conditions, uh, which kills lots of uh, clean water species. The same thing um, can be said for sedimentation. So this is runoff, this is erosion, lots of dirt um, and sediment in the stream, which um, clogs uh, organisms' ability to respire and, uh, and really uh, in, impedes um, visibility and, and a whole host of other things that can affect macroinvertebrates with those streams. So, uh, just as a quick example, um, I'll show you not to ignore this, this whole um, complex diagram here. Oxygen is pretty straightforward, right near where the sewage outfall is. Oxygen declines to very low levels because of all the bacteria and other things that are consuming that oxygen that uh, prevents um, uh, lots of um, clean water um, organisms from living there. So basically this community right here at the bottom of the sewage outfall is, uh, is pretty much limited to fungus and protozoa. Cyanobacteria won't even live there uh, and very few organisms can live there. The next things that as, as the water is, uh, is clean, those, those ammonium and ammonia as it's processed and, uh, and, and broken down into nitrates and nitrites, less uh, toxic forms of ammonia. Uh, these, these cleaner water um, organisms, definitely chironomids are generally uh, pollution tolerant, uh, but, but the point here is that as you move downstream, you have a, a, a community that gets more complex. So these are the effects of sewage. And of course, this happens at point sources uh, right, so think of a, of a raw sewage outfall, or think of a non-point source where there's um, there's an agricultural field that where lots of nutrients are are dumping into the system, or where there's a um, a septic tank or sewage that's leaking in the streams, and and this same sort of thing can happen over and over and over again as you move down the watershed. Okay, so um, a little bit of a retrospective study here. We see um, that in 1972, right before the EPA Clean Water Act was, uh, was passed, um, George Stanton did a study uh, during the summer with a bunch of students from CSU uh, and surveyed a bunch of streams in the Columbus area, all in the Bull Creek watershed. Uh, and um, my aquatic biology students took advantage of these data that we found in a filing cabinet in Lenore Hall as we were going through those data and we entered all of the macroinvertebrate data. We found these really cool pictures. And so I'm showing you some pictures from 1972. This is uh, Williamsburg, uh, Williamsburg uh, Drive. So this is Warm Springs and Williamsburg. That's between Schomburg, I don't know, I guess Schomburg and uh, I can't remember the other one. It's just to the east of, of Schomburg Road. Um, and uh, and th so this development was just going in in the early 70s. And what's missing here in these fields are silt fence. And there was a big rainstorm. They captured that big uh, rain event and showed that Cooper Creek, uh, which drains that area, was completely silted uh, in. And that had a big negative impact on the macroinvertebrates there. Of course, now, you know, there's, there's been a lot of uh, push towards making sure that you don't have all of this erosion in fields in development. And so they put silt fence up and things like that. But in 2018, this uh, area is built out, right? We have grass on the ground, we have trees growing, we have houses here. So we have a lot less erosion going into these streams now than we did in 72. And this, um, Okay, in this uh, picture, we see this uh, Google Earth map showing all the sites that were from 1972, but we went back to all of these sites in 2018 and 2019 in my aquatic biology class and sampled these ecosystems. So this is the Bull Creek watershed right here running along um, here in South Columbus, and then it does this big turn and then comes up and dumps into the Chattahoochee. Here's Waracoba right here, Lindsay, which runs through campus. Cooper Creek, which is just to the east of here, and then Flat Rock Creek. Flat Rock Park is kind of right up, uh, right up here. Uh, there's the dam at Flat Rock Pond. And then Bull Creek is up here. And this is kind of like uh, maybe right around where Warm Springs um, uh, crosses Flat Rock. I'm um, sorry, Bull Creek right up there. So those were the sites that we sampled. Um, took my students out there repeatedly to these sites, uh, collected macroinvertebrates. Our research was driven by three main questions. Has biodiversity improved since 1972? So we took the data from 72, compared it to 2018 and 2019 to answer that question. 
Uh, and then um, we also looked at how biodiversity might decline along that urbanization gradient from east to west towards the city of Columbus. And then um, finally, does impervious surface negatively affect biodiversity in 2018 and 2019? And, uh, and, and we would really like to get some impervious surface cover for the early 70s or even mid 70s, anything back there. But I have not been able to find any, um, any data on impervious surface to compare um, what's happened in the intervening 30 years. But uh, I think we can all sort of assume that the amount of concrete and asphalt that has been laid in those years has only increased. And so it's pretty clear that that's, that's increased. Okay, so in 1972, they used kick nets to sample the ecosystem. This is really uh, a nice way to study um, and collect macroinvertebrates. A person stands here with a net in the water and upstream of them, it's really important to do this upstream, uh, they disturb the, the bottom and then all of the macroinvertebrates that are disturbed, you can see these folks are kicking around in the stream, just upstream of the net. They get washed back into the net and then you get to pick them out and preserve them. The server sampler works the same way. It's just a small little square area that you disturb in front of the net that is right here. The Ekman dredge, you drop that down, you pull a, pull a line and that catches these clothes and catches a soil sample. Uh, they also did additional searches with D-frame nets. In 2018, we uh, employed the kick net to sample ecosystems just like they did in 72. And we also did a dip net search like they did. We did not use an Ekman dredge or a server sampler uh, in our sampling um, efforts. All right. And I have a chat. You have five minutes. All right, we got to run. Um, in, uh, in, so in 72, ah, I'm going to give you an example of a microinvertebrate in just a second. And here's one right here. So in 72, right, they identified things down to genus um, and they did counts. We also categorized these macroinvertebrates into three different categories. We did family level data, so not quite as resolved as the genus level data. We did counts as well. And then we, these are macroinvertebrates, right? They're little invertebrates. They look kind of like insects, roaches you might call them, uh, but they live in the water um, and they're indicators of water quality because these particular taxa, um, you can see the little gills right there along its abdomen, they are either sensitive or tolerant to pollution. Trichoptera, this group right here, these caddisflies are more tolerant to pollution. Mayflies are very intolerant generally to pollution. So if you don't see mayflies and you do see trichopterans, then you have good information that uh, the system is polluted. And, and they're long-term indicators because they always live in the stream. And so now on to some data. All right, so in blue is 1972. This is the family richness. So family richness is the, is the total number of families present. So the total number of basically taxonomic units present or the total number of different kinds of things present. So in 72, we have uh, these data. Notice generally the decline in the blue lines as you go down the watershed toward the Chattahoochee. In 2018 and 2019, generally the number of taxonomic units we collected was higher. So the number of families we collected was higher across the board compared to 72. Okay, and so there's tends to be higher richness lower in the watershed that suggests that that east to west pattern is present that things tend to um, become more polluted as you move downstream. Uh, that was certainly true in 72 and it's also apparent in 2018 and 2019, but to a lesser degree. Okay, these are the EPT. This is the, uh, the mayflies, the stoneflies and the caddisflies. In 72, in the low part of the ecosystem, you just don't have them. Um, and in 2018 and 2019, they're more prevalent in, uh, in, in, lower, in the lower parts of the ecosystem, right? So this looks like to me that this system has rebounded a bit in recent years. Um, this is a nice graph of, uh, in an, of a 
non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot. That's a really big mouthful. Um, or it's a it's an it's a way to assess community structure. Uh, basically, points that are closer together in space are more similar to each other. There are no axes uh, because it's a dimensionless um, set of data of differences. So basically, what you see is in 2018 and 2019 they're very similar, and in 20 in 72 they're quite different. And in fact, BC 18 is very different than all these other ecosystems, BC-18 is low in the water, in the, in the watershed, very near the Chattahoochee. And that was driven by um, a couple of groups, one of them stoneflies. We have about two minutes before the question period starts. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just about to wrap up. Um, so the final question was about impervious surface or concrete uh, and what we found was that as concrete, as percent developed, as the amount of concrete increases, you end up seeing a decline in biodiversity, a decline in the number of families present. So that's pretty strong there. Uh, that negative uh, relationship is present. But you know, I think from a more optimistic perspective, Right, Columbus is more or less built out, especially in the southern parts of the of the of the watershed, and and so now I think we have kind of an opportunity to improve the water quality uh, that's there by taking steps and measures to eliminate wastewater runoff, uh, non-point sources of pollution in the watershed. But in the northern part of the ecosystem, there's still development in the upper portions of the watershed. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, Maple Ridge in 1993. So, oh, okay, Schomburg and Blackman are right here. This is Noon Road. So you can see that there's evidence of a of a um, of the golf course here, Maple Ridge Golf Course. But in 2017, you can see there's now houses and roads all through that golf course. That's a lot more impervious surface. And then there's this new development here that wasn't present at all here in 93. So there's still evidence of development, especially in the northern part of the ecosystem. You can also see that over here in Gray Rock, uh, along Gray Rock Road, there's development there now. So in conclusion, right, um, seems that biodiversity has improved between then and now. The, it, it appears that the, that the Clean Water Act has worked in this ecosystem, in this watershed, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do, okay? So um, we noticed that with increasing impervious surface, biodiversity has declined. We got to reduce um, runoff, reduce nutrient pollution. And I think we have uh, a great opportunity to do that because um, the folks at the Columbus Water Works uh, know this and want to, want to work towards improving the water quality in our ecosystems. They also know about the beavers that are really uh, quite common in the urban, uh, urban streams that are running through our backyards. Right, so this is a beaver dam uh, along Cooper Creek, which is just to the east of here, just to the east of here. Um, and, uh, and, and I actually, the day we were sampling, we saw the beavers that were a part of this beaver dam. Since this beaver dam has been removed uh, by, um, by the city. Here's just a picture of the students working uh, and collecting uh, organisms. They're all smiles because it's a great day to be in the stream. Thank you guys for your time and I'll take questions. All right, so um, Hannah, did I answer, answer your question? Uh, the one that I just asked about what can we do as citizens to help the ecosystem? Right, okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, as, a, as a resident of, of Columbus. First, you can um, support organizations like uh, the Chattahoochee River Conservancy Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Chattahoochee River Keeper. Both of those organizations are in this area and you can support them. Um, you can support organiza organizations like Trees Columbus that plants and preserves and protects the tree canopy. So those are some ways that you can, you can do that um, either with your, your participation by planting trees or by going and doing um, trash cleanups and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that would be a really great way to, to, to go about doing that. If you're really interested in getting involved in doing some citizen science, like going out and collecting these macroinvertebrates and reporting that, there's a program in Georgia uh, that uh, basically you go through and you get trained on how to um, identify these organisms to very rough taxonomic scales. And you can, um, 
you can then go out and collect those and report those data citizen science that's interesting okay. i also had another question about the beavers because we did have a, a beaver living in the backyard um in the creek um so that is that um evidence of the creek being cleaner or like do beavers give you the information about the quality of the ecosystem around them or oh uh, so that's a that's a you know beavers are, are one of these polarizing animals um they are are not necessarily an indicator of clean water. Um, beavers are ecosystem engineers, much like humans are ecosystem engineers. They come into an area and they change that area to suit their needs. So they'll take a stream and turn it into a wetland. Yeah. <laughs> and and so so from a from a, a neighborhood perspective, that's very bad because that means water is going to back up into people's backyards. It's going to increase erosion uh, and and basically take back land that that people thought that they had. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but you know, in a, in a wild area, beavers can be fantastic for um, improving biodiversity because they, they facilitate the colonization of a lot of species into an area that, normal, that otherwise would not be there. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. it, that's a tough call. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use beavers as an indicator of of stream quality. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. And I and one more question is: I know you focused on the area around the Flat Rock Park, and I noticed is that we live around there. I noticed there are a lot of people, you know, kind of swimming in it. What is the? Do you know of the quality of water in that area? Sometimes I wonder if it's just runoff from the around neighborhoods, or is it really clean enough? <laughs> okay. So up at up around Flat Rock Park. And above um, above the hiking trail and mm -hmm. above the the impoundment there at Flat Rock Park, the dam. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I haven't done a whole lot of sampling up there, but uh, but it's that's fairly okay. So the higher you are in any given stream, the better mm -hmm. the water quality is. Mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't drink the water, and I wouldn't <laughs> put my face underwater in Flat Rock Creek. But gotcha. but playing in it and things like that, I'm that's okay. okay. That's all right. Uh, I wouldn't do that in Lindsay Creek or where Cobra Creek or even Cooper Creek. Mm -hmm. But Flat Rock it's Creek, you're far enough east and you're above above the dam there, above Macon Road, mm -hmm. um, and and that would be that would be generally okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Thanks, I appreciate that. Anybody have any other questions? I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Um, so <clears throat> I was wondering after a big, do you know, after a big um, rain where you get a lot of sedimentation, um, how bad does that hit some of those macroinvertebrate populations? Does it, does it wipe them out of the area? Um, or do they can they withstand that? Um, and if they if they are taken out of an area due to uh, water quality, how long does it take them to reestablish? Mm, that's a hard question to answer. But uh, but yeah, when you have a big flood event and a scouring and a lot of sedimentation coming down, that that disrupts the system quite a bit. Uh, and a lot of those organisms are pushed downstream. But it's important to remember that organisms upstream. Are being pushed downstream too and so in a, in a sense everything is sort of shifted down and they'll recolonize relatively quickly after um after a big rain event mm -hmm. so depending on the level of of disruption it could be weeks to months okay uh, and uh, so that's like a kind of a sedimentation turbidity type event or, or, or water velocity, but it, would it be uh, much longer uh, if you have a, uh, obviously if you have a, a point source of pollution that, that mm -hmm. enters a stream that could alter it until the, until the pollution's gone, right? That's right. So then you would, you would see um, a very um, pollution tolerant community of, of bugs living there. And, uh, and, and that would, so, that would take a long time to recover. You'd have to remove the point source and then uh, all of those nutrients and everything would have to be processed, you know, slowly over, over time and removed from the system before the clean water taxa started showing back up. Okay, thank you so much for this. And it looks 
from even this last set of pictures that you and your team have a lot of fun getting to go out there and do this data collection. So there's going to be a, a 10 minute break about before the next session begins at 10. Y'all can choose to stay in this breakout room if this is the one that you're going to be in for the next session or there's an option to leave the room, make sure you click leave the breakout room instead of leaving the meeting or else you get bumped off the entire call. And um, I'll probably see you a little bit later today for another session. Please give a emoji clap or a round of applause for our presenters today to give them thanks for taking time out of their day to present and share some of their knowledge with us. So thank you guys. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome, everyone. Um, you can choose your own room if you have that capability in the breakout rooms in the toolbar. Uh, we are so happy you're here. If you cannot um, join the breakout room on your own, please type in the chat which breakout room you would like to go to, and we will move you to that room.